What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat BDGE fantasy football. This actually won't be the HQ for much longer. Your man's went apartment hunting in BK, Brooklyn, Brooklyn this weekend. Found a beautiful apartment. So the HQ is going to look a little different in about a month. Moving dates either going to be March 15th, April 1st, depending on whether or not my credit score checks out with the realtor and whatnot. But I just thought that was a cool announcement for y'all. Today in this HQ, the one that you've come to grow and know and love, we're going over the quarterback rankings. We did our top 10 running back rankings last week, our top 10 wide receiver rankings for 2019 fantasy football. Today we're going to do the quarterback rankings. Friday will be the tight end ranking. As I always do, I break them down very, 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 very in depth. So I only have time to do the top 10 quarterback rankings. If you want my full top 20 quarterback rankings, you can click the link down below. It'll be the first link in the descriptions as well as the comment section. That's all I got to say for y'all for now, forever, for this intro. Man, I don't know what I'm doing today, but let's get into the video. All right, when we talk about quarterbacks, man, here's the thing. It's time to make quarterbacks great again. What's the what would be this the hat for that? M Q G wait, M Q make America. Oh, it'd be M G that doesn't even make no fucking sense. Whatever. It's time to make quarterbacks important in fantasy again, guys. It's it, if you're not playing in super flex leagues, last year was the first league, the first time I went heavy. I played a super flex league in 2017. Last year almost all of my Fantasy leagues turned into super flex leagues, and super flex opens up a flex spot in which you could play an additional quarterback. And if you have a super flex league, you are 99.9% .9 of the time playing a second quarterback. So it's basically a two quarterback league. Yo, I'm really, really, really sick of the whole like analysis of just late round quarterback. It makes like quarterbacks are so important in real football, in real NFL, and it should be the same in fantasy. At least them having some sort of value is what we should be going to. And I'm telling you. Once you go towards Superflex, you never go back. It's like when you finally move from standard to half PPR, or even a full PPR, uh, you know, it, it's the best thing you can do for your lead. If I had to give an analogy, it's kind of like the first time you, you slipped your fingers down your girl's pants, you know what I mean? Like you're nervous, you're not really sure what to do, you're not sure about the best strategy. Do you go with one? Or do you go with two? I'm talking about your super flex lineup, not your fingers, you sick fucks, grow up. But you have confidence that you're going to find the hole and that you're going to fill it. And I'm talking about your quarterback slots, you sick fucks, grow up. Anyways, yeah, I'm just really sick of uh, the analysis on quarterbacks being like, yeah, don't draft anyone, just draft someone late and you're fine and that be it. Like quarterback is so important and uh, it's just lazy analysis and I'm sick of it. And going into drafts, you should have to know you know, the best late round picks at a quarterback. Um, you should have to look at their strength of schedules. You should have to not just be able to pick anyone up off the waiver wire and and be fine and it not matter at all because it's so important in football. So we are officially vetoing one quarterback leagues in 2019. I'm not planning in one quarterback leagues. If you invite me to a league and it's a one quarterback league, I'm going to say, freak you. That's all I got to say. Super flex leagues for 2019. For president, let's get it. Our number one ranked quarterback for 2019 fantasy football, Patrick Mahomes. Step on the scale. Patrick Mahomes, step off the scale. All right, this is the consensus pick. It's really not difficult. I shouldn't have to waste time and break it down, but I'm going to do it because I always bring the big facts. We're going to take like 38 minutes to break down every player here. Uh, basically, not basically, he was the quarterback who had the best fantasy football season of all time. 5,097 passing yards, the ninth most of all time, only the seventh player to hit 5,000 passing yards in a season, which seems like a low number. It seems like someone does it every season until you realize that it's just Drew Brees doing it over and over and over and over again. So only the seventh player to hit 5,000 passing yards in a season, 50 touchdowns, second most of all time, tied for second most of all time, third player ever to hit that 50 touchdown mark. Brady was 30 when he hit 50 touchdowns. Manning, what Peyton Manning was 37 when he hit 50 touchdowns. Mahomes was 23 years old last year. He also added 272 rushing yards on 60 carries, an additional three scores. Over the last two years at college, 
he added 10 rushing touchdowns and then 12 his final year. So those are not something that I expect to be inconsistent or for them to fluctuate. He is going to be, I would say three is probably his floor in terms of rushing touchdowns on a year over year basis um, in fantasy going forward. So that's always, you know, great to have. Um, and, and that's what made him, that's what made him have the best fantasy football season of all time not only from the quarterback position, but the most fantasy points ever scored. He had 272 yards, three scores. Peyton Manning, the year he threw for 55 touchdowns, had negative 31 rushing yards on 32 attempts. That was in 2013. Um, and as I say pretty often, one of the more predictive statistics about a quarterback is his touchdown rate. The percentage of his throws that go for touchdowns, and you can usually look at his career rate um, or the seasons around that specific year and be able to tell whether or not those those numbers are going to come down or they're going to go up in the following season. Um, now, Mahomes threw for touchdowns on 8.6% of his passes in 2018. That is the seventh highest mark of all time. Even in college, he was just at 6.8%. So it went up to 8.6% in 2018. Peyton Manning's career touchdown rate is 5.7%. Brady, 5.5%. Aaron Rodgers, 6.2%. Here is a list of quarterbacks who are ahead of his 8.6%, seventh highest percentage of all time, included their touchdown rates for that specific season, as well as the following season. So, so Peyton Manning had a season of 9.9%, went down to 6.2% in the following year. Ken Stabler, 9.3 to 6.8. Deshaun Watson, 9.3 to this year, 5.1. Aaron Rodgers, 9.0 to 7.1. Tom Brady, 8.7 to 5.0. Mark Ripon, Ripian, I don't know who the fuck that is. 8.7% down to 4.6%. And I also look, so, so basically what I'm saying is this. I, I'm, I'm giving you the context, the pretext that he is very, 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 very unlikely to repeat those passing numbers touchdowns. Uh, he's still absolutely the quarterback one. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, but he'll probably throw for like 4,800 yards and 40 touchdowns next year instead of 50 touchdowns. Still makes him a fantastic pick at quarterback one. You also remember how the year started off. Like Kareem Hunt didn't, I think Patrick Mahomes threw for about 13 passing touchdowns before Kareem Hunt ran the ball into the end zone before they had a rushing touchdown. Remember a lot of the beginning of the year, they were doing that popular play at the goal line where you do like a shovel pass and it counted as a passing touchdown as opposed to a rushing touchdown. The Chiefs did that like three or four times over the first couple of games. Uh, the other offenses started to incorporate that and then it kind of stopped working as the year went forward. So he had a lot working right for him in the beginning of the year that I think kind of paced those numbers out really, really, really far ahead of what the mean should be. So that number is going to fall from 8.6 probably down to, on average, you can see most of these fell almost a full 3%. And over the course of 550 pass attempts, 3% is going to be a huge knock off your passing touchdown numbers. Like I said, still easily the quarterback one, probably going to go for like 48 and 40. Still going to get four or five rushing touchdowns. Um, what else is pretty crazy is that Mahomes' weapons had the second most drops in the NFL with 32 drops. So his numbers could have been even bigger. Only Case Keenum actually had more drops by his wide receiver. Patrick Mahomes, the big argument with Patrick Mahomes is where are you going to take him? Since we are acknowledging super flex leagues only, he is probably going to be a top five pick. I would say he'll drop to like maybe pick seven and the latest in most ADPs uh, overall. So for those of you guys who are only playing in one quarterback league, super flex leagues make the quarterback position ridiculously valuable because if you're playing in a 12-team league, you need to start two quarterbacks, right? So everyone takes two. That knocks off 24 automatically off the board. By simple math, there's only 32 starting quarterbacks in the NFL. 24 of them are already drafted and in starting lineups of your fantasy league. That only leaves eight. So most people are going to take a backup. If not, every team is going to try to at least take a backup quarterback because you're going to have bye weeks. You're going to have injuries. So you always want to have a third quarterback leaving zero waiver wire quarterbacks. So getting quarterbacks is very, 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 very valuable in those leagues. Uh, in one quarterback leagues, I'm still not touching him before round four. You could say what you want. Yeah, you take him in the fucking first round, second round. It's, it, it, it's wrong. It's wrong. The mathematics tell you that even Patrick Mahomes best fantasy quarterback of all time, still only average about six points more per game than the quarterback two. Six points more per game. There's no reason to take him over the next quarterback when the running back one compared to the running back seven is averaging like nine points more per game. The positional value, although this was the best quarterback of all time, 
and uh, you're not expecting to re repeat the best quarterback of all time numbers tells you that it's probably going to be a closer gap between quarterback one and quarterback two next year, whether that's Rodgers, who's bouncing back for 42 passing touchdowns or whatever. Uh, it just, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, please, if you're in a one quarterback league, do not take Patrick Mahomes in the top two. I say not the top three rounds. The fourth round is when I would start looking at him. Quarterback number two. <coughs> Aaron Rodgers, Green Bay Packers. A-Rod had his worst fantasy season ever in 2018. He threw for only 4,442 yards, 25 to 2 touchdown interception ratio. I think that's something that you guys need to understand. He still had a 25 to 2 touchdown interception ratio. Uh, added 269 rushing yards on the ground, an additional two scores. The problem was that he was going very, very, very early in drafts. And this was the reason why you feel like he kind of got gypped as an Aaron Rodgers owner. He was a first rounder in almost all of the super flex leagues that I participated in. I think the, the farthest he went down was possibly like an early second round pick. He finished as QB7 overall, QB9 in fantasy points per game, which is not a good ROI if you're drafting him that early, obviously. He finished with fewer than 20 fantasy points in 11 of his 16 games, which is extremely uncharacteristic of a guy like Aaron Rodgers, who's usually hitting 20 fantasy points weekly. Like that's usually his floor during his peak fantasy years. I think it was a mix of a lot of things. One of them was that leg injury that he suffered kind of in the beginning of the year um, that like, you know, that, that wasn't letting him move around the pocket too effectively. And that's part of his game. He's not someone who scrambles that much, but he's very good at eluding pressure. And that's something that um, usually boosts his statistics. And that was something that kind of held him back. And obviously that is, uh, that plays into his, his outlook, right? And there's also the, dysfunc the dysfunction between Rodgers and Mike McCarthy at head coach. He also never really had a second weapon behind Devontae Adams. That's why Devontae Adams had like 17,000 targets a game. Randall Cobb was off and on injured. Geronimo Allison stepped up for a little bit, but he only played in five games last year. And then he had three rookies who, you know, if you're Aaron Rodgers, you need to be someone who, or if you're a weapon for Aaron Rodgers, you need to be someone who gains chemistry. Aaron Rodgers looks at you and passes the ball to you if you guys have a good connection and if you have a chemistry. And if you don't, then he won't pass the ball to you. Um... What else was I saying? Yeah, Jeremy, Jimmy Graham sucks. I told you all that. He's trash. So, you know, what's going to be different in 2019? They have a new head coach, Matt LaFleur, which I didn't like the hiring of. I think that was a very quick hire and someone without experience as like a head coach that would take on Aaron Rodgers. You know, I, I think anything is better than Mike McCarthy and his like dinosaur type offense in terms of like the, the routes that he has his wide receivers run. It's just nothing improving and nothing being dynamic inside that offense. Now, you know, you move over Matt LaFleur, who it's tough to say what he's done because he worked with Matt Ryan during his MVP campaign. He worked with Sean McVay in LA in 2017 with Jared Goff, but neither of those were his offenses. He finally moved over to Tennessee last year where he was calling the plays as the OC. They didn't have a good year offensively, but Mariota's banged up for the most part, so it's kind of hard to tell what he really did. Matt LaFleur does incorporate a lot of play action, a lot of you know motion behind the line of scrimmage, which is have been proven statistically to be very effective in today's offense, and it really lets the quarterback know where the defense is, if they're playing man, if they're playing zone. So those like pre-snap reads are going to be huge for Aaron Rodgers. Play action is going to be huge for opening up the pass for him uh, and things like that. So I do like Matt LaFleur coming over only because I hate Mike McCarthy as Aaron Rodgers' head coach. Um, what else do we got? You know, he's got all summer pretty much to gain chemistry with one of these wide receivers as a wide receiver too. <coughs> it likely would be drawn on my Allison if he could stay healthy. They do have Marquez Valdez-Scantling who flashed at times, but, you know, there was a big stretch over the middle of the season where he was getting like two or four targets a game and you could see Rodgers was not really happy throwing him the ball. I like Equinemius St. Brown. Um... I like Equinemius St. Brown as the guy to emerge. He's an athletic guy, and now that he's been in the offense for a year, he made a bunch of big plays last year. You know, he never showed consistency at producing at a high level, but I think, you know, a, uh, a year with Aaron Rodgers and this full offseason to kind of acquaint himself into the offense without Randall Cobb because he's going to be a free agent. He's going to be gone. Um, you know, I think he's someone to just keep an eye on. If they can emerge as someone with a, a wide receiver two spot, it could be nice for um, it could be nice for Aaron Rodgers is. Fantasy outlook. Um, and, and you look at like Andrew Luck, who was quarterback three on this list. He, you know, one of the big things, of course, was his offensive line. Green Bay's offensive line actually graded out as the number one pass blocking line per pro football focus, which is a little bit questionable considering they were 21st ranked per football outsiders and they let up the third most sacks in the NFL. So, I mean, it could be because his wide receivers couldn't get open and Aaron Rodgers didn't want to force it. 
Um, he didn't have a lot of weapons, so therefore he held on to the ball, and that's what led to the high number of sacks. But I don't know. That's uh, It's a weird discrepancy between being the first-ranked pass blocking line and the 21st, pro football focus, football outsiders. So uh, if there are any Green Bay fans out there, what some of my favorite comments I get on my YouTube channel are from fans of the teams, right? If I'm breaking down certain players and there are, there are people who are fans of that specific team, they are people who obviously watch, for the most part, watch like all 16 games. So they have a pretty good view or they have a different angle viewpoint of the analysis that I bring. So if you are a Green Bay fan or if you're a fan of any of the players, the teams of the players that I break down and you have a good viewpoint or you know, an opinion on something that I say and why that happened, please comment that down below. So if you're a Packers fan, I would love to know what your take on the offensive line was because being graded as the first overall line per PFF is something I feel like should have gotten a little bit more recognized and I feel like they were not that good. So let me know what you thought of the offensive line. If they were that good, then great. That's that's great analysis for Aaron Rodgers and that should be you know huge for him. So please do that. And uh, really at the end of the day, he's Aaron Rodgers. So I'm not going to put him anywhere past QB2. At worst, I could see you putting that QB3 behind Andrew Luck of the Colts. <clears throat> Finished the year 2018 with 4,593 passing yards, 39 touchdowns, 15 interceptions. Oddly enough, he had a career low 148 rushing yards and zero touchdowns. In the four other NFL seasons that he had been the full starter for, for the full year, he added 309 rushing yards on average, three and a half rushing touchdowns. So 148 this year, zero scores. On average, 309, three and a half scores. <clears throat> Maybe that had to do with him having shitty offensive lines over the previous years and him having to scramble and run more. Who knows? Uh, those rushing numbers aren't really predictable for a quarterback for the most part, but I thought it was worth noting in my humble ass opinion. I I M H A O. Uh, he started off the year slow, but once he got hot, there was really no stopping Andrew Luck and this Colts offense, right? Starting in week four, Luck had a streak where he threw for three or more touchdown passes in eight straight games. You know, Aaron Rodgers, like I said before, had fewer than 20 fantasy points in 11 of 16 games. Luck threw for 20 fantasy points in those eight straight games, which is is crazy. And like I said, the big story here, of course, was that offensive line, man. Chris Ballard of the in the, in the office there has really been fucking whipping in the kitchen, making sure this personnel, these rosters in Indianapolis are up to par with the talent of Andrew Luck. And they finally got it. That's what happened in 2018, man. They were the best pass blocking line in the NFL per football outsiders and allowed a league low 18 sacks. Basically, just wasn't touched over the second half of the year. So that makes more sense. Aaron Rodgers, that Green Bay line ranked first per PFF and were sacked the third most in the NFL. No, they were 21st in Football Outsiders. But the Colts were number one per Football Outsiders, league low 18 sacks. That, that math adds up a little bit more. He did slow down a little bit towards the end of the year and didn't put up as many fantasy points. The Colts opted to kind of ride their ground game and ride Marlon Mack down the stretch, which can be a concern, I guess, um, from Andrew Luck's standpoint, but I don't want to get too into the numbers and start getting too granular to the point where you're just overlooking the situation that Luck has elite arm talent and arm strength behind an elite offensive line. Um, you know, and, and, and the thing is, like, he put up some of his best career numbers from an efficiency standpoint, not necessarily from a volume standpoint. And he did this with almost nothing to work with, right? He had T.Y. Hilton, who was a stud, of course, and he's his wide receiver one, has been for a while. Uh, but Hilton missed a few games. He was banged up for a few other games. And outside of him, it was like Ryan Grant or Chester Rogers as his wide receiver two for the large majority of the year. I know a few of you are going to be like, oh, don't trail Inman. Okay, fucking Don trail Inman is an average level wide receiver. That was the wide receiver two in Indy for like fucking two seconds. So don't get me started there. Yes, he had Eric Ebron. Great red zone target this year for sure. Um, but I wouldn't say that Eric Ebron is someone who like crazily elevated Lux play. So realistically, he had, he had a very average group of weapons, if not below average, that can be improved upon, which is a good thing for Andrew Lux's fantasy outlook. I mean, he set a completion percentage high, career completion percentage high, 2018. Um, he attempted the eighth most deep pass passes uh, for quarterbacks in the NFL in 2018, converted on 48.6% of them, which was sixth highest in the NFL. Five of them were dropped, which was the third highest number in the NFL. So that number could have been much higher. His stats could have been better. If they add a piece opposite of T.Y. Hilton in the draft, one of the better wide receivers is a very good wide receiver draft class. Lux floor will be monstrous. So we're going to move on to quarterback number four. Before we do so, again, guys, I'm going to go through the top 10 here. If you want the top 20, the link will be the first link in the description. I am going to open up or start posting content again on Patreon, patreon.com slash BDGE. That's where I give away 
um, private content, exclusive premium content for those of y'all that subscribe to me there. It's a, it's a monthly subscription basically where throughout the reason the season, I give you my weekly rankings, um, which I don't do on YouTube. And throughout the summer, I'm going to open up leagues that are only for big dogs, audience members. That's also where I might give out my dynasty rankings on Patreon there. So uh, that will probably come out before the NFL draft, as well as a few more other pieces of premium content. So if you want to become Patreon premium content subscriber for big dogs, head over to patreon.com slash BDGE and I will see y'all over there. Oh, we're also going to do a live stream. So if you've been following myself, Snacks and Animal in our Fade the Public weekly podcast, uh, we're going to start doing a weekly mock draft on Saturdays. It's going to be a live mock draft. So we're going to do them Saturday and we're going to do them with audience members, but only Patreon members. We're going to put the content up on YouTube after we do the live drafts. But if you are a Patreon member, we're going to choose, you know, seven different members each week to draft with us. So we're going to be doing mock drafts every Saturday, us three, seven Patreon members as well. So that's another addition, another premium piece of content that, um, that you guys will be able to join us for. And we might do some Madden streams on Twitch for our Patreon members. So we got a lot of, lot of cool things whipping up in the works right now for Patreon members. So patreon.com slash BDGE. We'll see y'all over there. <coughs> Let's move on to quarterback number four. It is Deshaun Watson of the Houston Texans. I love Watson this year. If he falls to a value, I absolutely hated him last year because people were drafting him within like the top 45 picks as quarterback two, sometimes quarterback one based off a seven game sample size in his rookie year in which he fucking threw for touchdown passes on 9.3% of his throws. And as you could see, it fucking was unrealistic to think that he was going to come anywhere near. It almost dropped to a half, but I have a lot of good things to say about Deshaun Watson this year. He threw for 4,165 passing yards, 26 to nine touchdown to interception ratio, adding as always those ground yards, 551 rushing yards, five ground touchdowns, finished as fantasy's quarterback four. That rushing is what you love about Deshaun Watson. His touchdown rate, like I said, fell tremendously, 9.3% down to about 5.1%. That's why everyone is yelling regression, regression, regression. There's no way that he could do it again in 2018, and he didn't. He threw seven more touchdown passes in 2018 than he did in 2017, but he played in nine more games, and he had 301 more pass attempts, but only had seven more passing touchdowns. Still finished as quarterback four in fantasy. And he had a lot working against him, in my opinion, in 2018. Their offensive line is fucking atrocious. They are just miserable. I don't know what they're doing over there. They ranked dead last in pass blocking per football outsiders last year. They allowed the most sacks in the NFL. 62 sacks on the year, which is almost four a game. Um, but Watson himself as a passer became a much better quarterback in 2018, right? Just from a passing perspective I'm looking at. He's always going to give you those ground yards, which is fantastic, especially if you're not playing in a six-point passing touchdown league. He raised his completion percentage from 61.8% to 68.3% from his rookie year to his sophomore year. But more importantly, his adjusted completion percentage, which is a stat that you can get from PFF. If you if you want to uh, sign up for one of the PFF packages, they're awesome. I highly, highly recommend them. They do an elite package and an edge package. The edge package, I believe, is $30 for the entire year. The elite is maybe like $170 for the entire year. Um, it comes with a lot more granular stats and stuff that you probably don't need. If you want either of them, I have a link down below along with a promo code that will get you like $5 off the $30 package. It gets you all their player grades. It gets you all these like in-depth stats that I think is really cool, very worth it. I barely get a kickback on any of these, so it's not worth me plugging other than I think it's awesome for you guys. But <clears throat> that will be linked down below in the section that says promo codes or some shit. Um, his adjusted completion percentage, which is a stat by PFF, which accounts for throwaways and spiked balls and all that extra shit that doesn't really matter, that doesn't is not predictive in how well a quarterback throws the ball, takes those out. Watson was at 65.6% in 2017. That went up to 76.1% in 2018. So it was a full 10.5% increase in adjusted completion percentage, which tells you he got a lot better as a passer, a lot more accurate. He was just better with his throws, and he was far less reckless in his second year as well. In 2017, he threw a deep pass on 20% of his pass attempts, which is a crazy number. That number dropped down to 11.1%, so almost in half um, in 2018, which was sandwiched in ranks right between Drew Brees and Andrew Luck. Good company. What else, you know, that I think 
he had working against him that can go his way in 2018 or 2019 is he never really had a consistent number two there for him, right? They have great wideouts, weapons on the team, but no one can stay healthy, right? Will Fuller is healthy, but I mean, Will Fuller is great, but it can't stay healthy. Kiki QT came in as a rookie, came into the year with this hamstring injury that lingered, caused issues throughout, but was still good when healthy. Um, and, and Watson benefited when either of those guys was on the field. So Fuller played in only seven games last year, but he went for over 100 yards and or a touchdown in four of those seven. Kiki QT, same thing, played in seven games um, and went over 100 yards and or a touchdown in three of them. So while they were on the field, they were great wide receiver two options. If he has all three of those guys, D-Hop, QT, and Will Fuller on the field, he's going to have a great arsenal of weapons to work with next year. Demarius Thomas sucks. I, I don't want to hear anything about him. There, I don't think they're going to re-sign him. I don't, I'm not even sure what his contract status is. I'm just assuming that he's going to be off the team. Um, he's literally horrible. He had one good game last year and was literally just to piss me off on fantasy because I needed him to score less than like 24 points on Monday Night Football to win my game. And of course, for the first time since like 2014, he went over 24 fantasy points. Um, so you know what? Fuck Demarius Thomas. That's all I got to say about that. Anywho, I love Deshaun Watson. Um, and... and what I love most about Watson is he has an, a weekly upside that many fantasy quarterbacks do not have. Like, he'll throw for 250 and two touchdowns, basically like Lamar Jackson, but with a good passing stat line. He'll go for that 250 and two, but on any given week can also add 40 to 60 yards and a score or two on the ground, which is huge, which boosts your solid quarterback one numbers, you know, from like 20 or 24 fantasy points up to 30 or 35 fantasy points and that's the difference when it comes to Watson I love that week over week random upside that you know you might not know when it's going to come but it will come um, a few times a year so Watson's four number five and this is probably going to be a little bit of a surprise and I hope I get pushback on this because I like to fade the public but for those of y'all that are smart you'll you'll understand why I put him here Jameis Winston my quarterback five for 2019 fantasy football Tampa Bay Bucks quarterback you can't talk to me about Winston. I'm telling you, you can't fade me off Winston, at least not logically speaking. He was my absolute favorite late round quarterback going into 2018 fantasy football. But unfortunately, you know, he had that weird fucking incident in the Uber where he got suspended for three games. Um, so that like killed anything that you can get excited about for 2018. But the sharp players will be with me on this analysis for 2019. And I think that will eventually push Winston's ADP into the top 10. Um, right now, he's literally quarterback 19 in Fantasy Football Calculator, which I think their ADP is pretty fucking terrible right now. But we'll put, he'll get pushed up eventually. The first and foremost thing to understand is that the Bucks quarterback position last year between Ryan Fitzmagic and Jameis Winston combined for 385.8 fantasy points, quarterback two in fantasy football, only behind Patrick Mahomes. Two and a half fewer fantasy points per game than Patrick Mahomes. That should kind of tell you everything you need to know. But if we're just looking at Winston on a fantasy points per game basis, he was quarterback 11 last year. If you take out the games in which he attempted less than 20 passes, so those were, you know, games in which he got benched or games in which he went in after Fitzpatrick got benched. So you're looking at, you know, games in which he was the full-time starter. And in points per game, he was actually quarterback eight, right behind Cam Newton. You know, he's got Bruce Arians coming in, loves to throw the ball, loves to throw the ball deep at a high volume coming off, uh, you know, he's got a fresh off season. No off season problems on the mind, just football. He just turned 25. He's so young. These other quarterbacks are hitting the prime at 30, 33. Winston just turned 25. He has an ascending OJ Howard at tight end. Chris Godwin coming up as a wide receiver too. We'll have to see what happens with Deshaun Jackson. Mike Evans just had a career year, 28 was Winston's fourth NFL career season. It seems like he's been in the league for 10 years at this point. He has improved his completion percentage in every season that he's been in the NFL so far. He has improved his passing yards per game in any NFL season thus far. 2018 was his highest fantasy points per game season in the NFL thus far. He was also quietly, effectively running the ball as a fantasy quarterback. He was on pace for over 400 ground yards in 2018. You know, this is just a division that you want to own a fantasy quarterback in. First of all, Winston gets eight games in guaranteed warm weather down in Tampa Bay. Then two of his division games are in Atlanta, in New Orleans, in domes that are likely to be shootouts because that tends to happen in the NFC South. The Bucks defense is still trash. They're probably going to be throwing the ball a ton, going to have to catch up, whether it is catching up or the offense is just efficient. You know, it's just something that you want to own in 2019. Everything is lining up for Jameis Winston. I'm all in on him. He will be probably my highest own late round quarterback, even if he is going to be thrown up. 
turnovers left and right, fumbles the ball once, interception twice a game, whatever. He's going to more than make up for it through his production. 300 passing yards a game, multiple scores per game, a little bit of a rushing upside as you could see. He's going to have games where he throws for over 400 yards. He is the most likely quarterback who's being picked late round to finish as a top three quarter. Bye. That's that, bro. Move on to the second half of the top 10 rankings. My man's Matty Ice staying in division here. Atlanta Falcons. Now, Ryan was another quarterback who was a pretty easy late round quarterback target last year, in my opinion, thanks to the addition of Calvin Ridley and the mini breakout of fucking extra medium Austin Hooper. And uh, again, the elite dominant play of Julio Jones. Ryan finished as fantasy's quarterback two on the year behind Patrick Mahomes. Will he do that again? Highly doubtful. Uh, Ryan is very similar to a lot of the guys that I've kind of mentioned throughout this list in terms of the touchdown rate, right? During his MVP season in 2016, his touchdown rate soared up to 7.1%. That was after being at 5.2% or below in every one of his eight NFL seasons prior to that MVP season. Now, you knew that number was going to jump back down in 2017. It went really far down though, way below the norm. So that meant after a bad 2017 year, 2018, he was going to be underdrafted because people were like, oh, he can't throw touchdowns anymore. That was going to go back to the norm, right? He was drafted at quarterback 15 or later. He was an easy late round quarterback target. Ryan was a really, really, really good player in 2018. Threw for 4,924 yards, 35 touchdowns to seven interceptions. Those numbers were actually super, super close to his 2016 MVP campaign numbers, which is pretty crazy. Now, the big change up in Atlanta is they get rid of Steve Sarkeesian as their offense coordinator. They bring in former Bucks head coach Dirk Cutter who is going to be their new offensive coordinator. Now, the great thing about this is there's not a lot of confusion. There's not like any mystery here because Dirk Cutter has already been the OC in Atlanta while Matt Ryan and Julio Jones were playing for the Falcons, right? From 2012 to 2014, Cutter was their OC. Ryan's average passing numbers over those three NFL seasons, 631 attempts, never below 615. That would have ranked third in the NFL in 2018. 4,643 4, passing yards. This is the average of those three seasons with Cutter, uh, Dirk Cutter as the OC. Never below 4,515 passing yards. Hypothetical NFL rank in 2018 would have been quarterback four. 29 passing touchdowns per year on average. Never below 26th. NFL rank of 10th among quarterbacks in 2018. His fantasy finishes under Dirk Cutter. Quarterback seven, quarterback 12, quarterback seven. You have a QB one year over year with a pretty decent upside, pretty decent floor. Having these new weapons like Calvin Ridley, Austin Hooper, make him a great floor quarterback as well in fantasy. He's always been that, but now, you know, he has a better combination of floor and ceiling. Like I often say, when you're in the middle of the pack, right? When you're when your talent as a quarterback is not elite or not horrible, you're probably only going to be as good as your your talent around you so the um so the weapons the wide receivers the tight ends the pass catchers out of the backfield and your offensive line so uh ryan kind of falls into that that synopsis so he's going to be a better later on quarterback because of his weapons and a lot of the other ones that are kind of around him now i'd be shocked if he finished inside of the top three again at the position in terms of fantasy because that's just not who he is elite fantasy production year over year he doesn't do that but the other thing I'm, I'm just a tiny bit concerned about is his fourth quarter numbers. Now, I went kind of in-depth on this in the wide receiver rankings video from last week when I talked about Julio, because Julio put up a huge portion of his production in garbage time. So did Matt Ryan, right? They lost all their defensive players in the first couple weeks of the season, started letting up 40 points a game to all these opposing offenses. In turn, Matt Ryan and Julio were blowing up in the fourth quarter in garbage time, trying to catch up and just throwing up bombs and shit. So that does uh, kind of make me nervous a little bit because he's not going to have that much garbage time. The Falcons on paper are going to be a good team in 2019, but don't look too hard at it. He's a good floor play with good weapons, <laughs> a great home field to play at, you know, in the Dome, in Atlanta. So like Matt Ryan is quarterback six. We're going to get a little more in depth with quarterback seven, third straight NFC South quarterback. That's Drew Brees, QB seven. That's actually kind of funny because we have... Four quarterbacks in a row, all NFC South. We had Winston, quarterback five. Matt Ryan, quarterback six. Drew Brees, quarterback seven. Now, I'm not even sure I like Brees here, to be honest with you. And I feel like I'm probably going to drop him lower eventually. I feel weird dropping him. That's probably why. He's not someone that I want to draft at quarterback seven, uh, unless he really fell. So he's not a value necessarily at quarterback seven. But depending on where quarterback seven falls in your fantasy draft, that's going to depend on whether or not I like Brees there. Quarterback... Uh, 2018 was a remarkable year for Breeze from like an efficiency standpoint, right? Completion percentage was great, especially as adjusting completion percentage. 32 to 5 touchdown to interception ratio. 
but he threw his fewest pass attempts, 489 since 2004, uh, when he was back in San Diego. He failed to hit the 4,000 yard passing mark for the first time as a quarterback in New Orleans. Um, you know, and if you're looking at these numbers and saying, hmm, doesn't that mean positive regression? And this is, you know, I talked about this again with Michael Thomas's numbers in the wide receiver rankings video. I would say no, because we look at, again, the career touchdown rate. He threw for a touchdown on 6.5% of his passes last year. 32 touchdowns on just 489 attempts. His career rate, 5.3%, up to 6.5%. In New Orleans, it's been 5.5%. So, um, you know, it, it's been much lower than that number, the 6.5 he threw for in 2018 over the last five years. So I believe that's going to drop down. He also ranked 19th in deep ball attempts per player fo profiler last year. The other thing that scares me is this. His home and away splits, man. Horrible, right? These are monster splits. 31 points per game at home versus 19.8 on the road. And these have been pretty consistent throughout Breeze's career. And I think they tailed off a little bit. He got more even over the last couple of years, which kind of made us as fantasy players let our guard down a little bit and think, nah, Breeze is good all the time. Came back and uh, no, he played way better at home. And that makes sense playing inside the dome as opposed to on the road, maybe in cold weather or whatever. So sure, this makes him a great play at home. This makes him a great streaming quarterback because you know which games to play him, which games not to play him. Uh, but you know, that I think that takes him out of contention for being an elite top five fantasy quarterback, which is what you've probably expected. Also, this other split is concerning. If you look at him versus top 12 defenses on the year versus, you know, the bottom, whatever that is, 19, eight, uh, 20 defenses, 16 and a half points per game fantasy against top 12 defenses versus almost 30 versus the bottom 20 defenses. Now, it's not going to be a huge issue for Breeze, given that, you know, you don't play top 12 fantasy defenses weekly, like all the time, especially not in that de uh, that division. But I think it just speaks to the larger picture of Breeze that he's not this amazing fantasy quarterback anymore. And he's not someone that you could just plug in your lineup and feel great about him all the time. If it's a tough defensive matchup or if he's on the road, you're not going to feel that good. And that's kind of the reason that I said, you know, I'm not that comfortable with him as QB7 anymore. He had four games during the fantasy year that he scored fewer than nine fantasy points. And those are, you know, those are weak losing games if you have him as your quarterback. Now he had some really big games, right? He had those, he had five individual games with more than 28 fantasy points, which are huge games. And those will probably help you win a week. But I dove a little bit deeper into those games, right? And I wanted to break down, you know, I want to put this stuff into context, not just say, oh, he's boomer bust or, oh, he's this or that. Week one, that was that ridiculous shootout game against Tampa Bay where Fitzpatrick and him both threw for like 9,000 yards. And Breeze scored 29.6 fantasy points. And we came to find out that Tampa Bay had one of the worst passing defenses in the entire NFL. Miserable. Week three, Breeze put up 40 fantasy points. That was against Atlanta. Again, the beginning of the year, Atlanta lost everybody on defense. And they were giving up 40 fantasy points a game to opponents. Um, so that was an explanation for that. 31.4 fantasy points for Breeze against the Rams. In, I think it was week eight or week nine, they were they didn't have a keep to leave. And throughout that period, they were giving up a ridiculous amount of points as well to opposing fantasy quarterbacks. He had uh, another one of his big games of more than 28 fantasy points at Cincinnati, who by that point in the season had completely fallen apart. They gave up the third most fantasy points to quarterbacks on the year. And then the last game in which he put up more than 28 fantasy points was against Philadelphia, who literally did not have a secondary throughout the regular season last year. So it's like, yeah, five great games. Sure, and it might seem like I'm stretching it or like really nitpicking here, but if you look, if you put that into context, every game was like against a horrible defense. And I'm not sure Breeze, if you know, if he doesn't have all those things break right where all these injuries occur to these teams he's playing against, or they're like, you know, ridiculous shootouts. I, I don't think he gets I don't think he's that elite fantasy quarterback really anymore. And I've been banging this drum for like two years now. The fact that New Orleans has this very short window to win the Super Bowl, and who knows, they might have pulled it off if that whole fucking PI call happened this year. Uh, their game plan is to keep Breeze on his feet, healthy, dump the ball off very quickly to slot receivers, to running backs, run the ball a lot, just keep Breeze healthy. The other thing I would say is, you know, I was I was looking at, like, why, why do we think Kamara, why do we think Michael Thomas fell off very heavily, you know, over the, as the year went on? And one of the things that popped into my head was maybe this, like in 2017, New Orleans came into the year as one of the worst defenses. They were like a laughing stock of the NFL, right? And they, by the end of the year, they were very good. Now that happened in 2018 as well. Remember that the first game, like I said, was against Tampa Bay. They let up a shitload of points. New Orleans defense looked really bad in the beginning of the year. And then just like the Patriots, how they usually get better and better, which usually happens when you have a good coach. So that makes sense, right? Bill Belichick gets his team in line. Sean Payton does the same thing. If you have a team that improves... 
right? New Orleans defense got much better as the year progressed. And guess what happens? When your defense plays better, they don't give up as many points. When you don't give up as many points, you don't need your offense to score as many points. So that's another factor. New Orleans, they, their defense typically starts off slow, gets better. As they get better, they're not going to need Breeze to throw the ball as much. I just think there's a lot working against Breeze, and I don't love him in 2019. Quarterback 8, Cam Newton. He's a make or big player this year in fantasy, in my opinion. We obviously know his upside when he's on the field. We've seen him be a top three, top five fantasy quarterback plenty of times in his career so far. But this shoulder scares the shit out of me. I likely won't own Cam this year unless he really drops in drafts, which he probably won't because the name value, right? Cam, it's Cam Newton. People aren't going to let him slip too far in drafts. There's not much to say. We all know, like I said, what his fantasy product is when he's healthy. But he's having his second serious shoulder surgery right now apparently this this shoulder surgery is not as significant or as serious as originally feared um and he's having it a lot earlier in the season in the off season than he had in the previous surgery right last year last year was uh they rushed him into the season by the time he got into the regular season and he wasn't even fully healthy yet and that you know they fucked him right he was he, way less than 100 starting the year he barely threw the ball in the preseason they set him up for failure. That was 100% on Carolina, the front office, the coaching staff. Stupid move by the franchise. Uh, that was easy to see coming. I will be passing on Cam uh, as a top five price if that is what he is going to be in fantasy this year. I'm not really sure. Uh, but, you know, QB8, he gives you a good upside and uh, floor combination if he's on the field to warrant this. So I'm probably backing away from most players who are injury I'm scared of them being injured, I guess. But, you know, y'all know uh, what Cam can, can offer. After Cam, we have the last two guys. Quarterback 9, quarterback 10. <clears throat> and I will ask, guys, if you are enjoying the video. I obviously put a lot of time, work, research, analysis into these videos. So uh, one way of just showing me you appreciate that is by scrolling down a little bit. If you're on YouTube, it's like a 0.2 second scroll. Hit that thumbs up button. Let's YouTube know y'all like my video and it'll show it to a bunch of people. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're new because we're going to be doing breakdowns like this, big facts only, this kind of shit all off season, and it will certainly help you uh, draft better. It'll help you win your chip, hopefully, in 2019. So thumbs up down below. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Drop a comment. That works with the YouTube algorithm. I don't know. It doesn't even matter what the fuck you got to comment. Right, yeah. Right, fucking QB rank, shabba shabba ranks, baby. Um, if you're on the podcast, then uh, scrolling down just a little bit and hitting five-star rating and review, I would love you for that. Um, so, yeah. Let's get the quarter, 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 quarterback. Nine, Russell Wilson, Seattle Seahawks. As long as Brian Schottenheimer is the OC in Seattle, it's going to really, really, really limit Russell Wilson's ceiling as a fantasy quarterback. And that's what we saw in 2018. Now he's still one of the most efficient quarterbacks in the NFL, but 427 fucking passing attempts. That's what he had last year. That was his lowest total since 2013. Fewer than Mitch Trubisky last year, Cam Newton, Baker Mayfield, all of them who missed multiple games last year. And just barely ahead of Sam Darnold, Blake Bortles, Josh Rosen, Wentz, Flacco, all who missed significant portions of the year. That that was like a ridiculously low number of pass attempts for Russell Wilson. I don't want to take anything away from Russ, right? Because he was awesome. He threw a career high 35 touchdowns to seven interceptions. Seahawks ran the ball 32.8 times per game this year. Second highest rate in the NFL, only behind Baltimore. The only reason Baltimore was higher than them was because Lamar Jackson was running the ball 48 times a game towards the end of the year, which boosted their numbers. So Seattle was basically... <clears throat> um, non-running, non-quarterbacks, they were the highest rushing volume team in the NFL last year. Ironically, somehow, Russell had a career low. 67 rush attempts, zero scores. Which I really don't know what to make of this, to be honest with you. He finished as quarterback eight in fantasy football. He threw a touchdown on 8.2% of his attempts in 2018. His career average in the six seasons prior was 5.7%. So guys, if you've learned anything from this fucking video already, it's the touchdown rate. Tells you whether or not they're gonna regress or progress the following year. That tells, that screams regression in that sense. Um, but Russell Wilson is different in this type of analysis compared to the other guys because Russell Wilson, where, you know, you could drop in efficiency. So he's someone you might be like, yeah, he's going to drop in efficiency because 8.2% touchdown rate is unsustainable. But he's also probably the only person you can reasonably expect their passing volume to go up. So if your volume goes up, your efficiency can go down and you could still put up, you know, top 10 fantasy numbers. We'll have to see. I mean, maybe they look at that playoff game and be like, yeah, we fucking ran ourselves out of the playoffs. We need to give Russ, one of the best quarterbacks, more of a shot to help us win the game. And maybe they do that more in the regular season. We'll have to see. Uh, the offensive line has certainly improved, right? But it, it, but it seems like 
I mean, it took fucking six years for them to do that for Russell Wilson, but it seems like it's going to benefit the running backs more um, than the actual passing game. Now, in, in terms of weapons for Russ, I mean, they're good. Nothing great, right? You have Baldwin, who was banged up all year. He's getting old. Who knows if he's going to be a serious playmaker like he once was for uh, for Russ. He got back to somewhat of the form towards the end of the year, but still definitely not elite. You got Tyler Lockwood at an all-time efficient uh, season, which is probably a big reason why Russell Wilson was so efficient because Tyler Lockett was Tyler Lockett had a perfect receiver rating when targeted 158.3 was the quarterback rating when Tyler Lockett was targeted um so Tyler Lockett's good yeah but they don't have a tight end they don't have any more real weapons behind those two uh so again they're good not great so while Wilson is still a phenomenal quarterback greatly efficient would love for him to run my NFL team as a fan uh he's not really an elite fantasy option in my eyes as long as Brian Schottenheimer is there calling the plays super super run heavy and we move on to our last quarterback, quarterback 10. Now, this was a tough one. There's a lot of players I think you could reasonably put here. There is Baker Baker, the touchdown maker. There is Big Ben. There is Dak Prescott, who is a top 10 quarterback over the second half of the year. There are There's Carson Wentz, who has been a top quarterback before, but had that down year. Brady, Super Bowl winning quarterback. Kirk Cousins, some of the best weapons in the league. Speaking of Baker Baker, uh, if you want to cop some big dogs here, some Faja hats, some daddy hats, as well as, you know, these are our premium Big Dogs exclusive t-shirts, as well as a bunch of other t-shirts we got on the site, bigdogsfantasy.com. Head over to the shop there. That will be linked down below. You can cop this gear. We just actually put up some new designs on the site. If you are a Redskins fan, go check that out because they got some cool ones up there. But number 10 goes to Jared Goff, Los Angeles Rams, and all those other guys I named, I will explain in the notes down uh, after I get through the 10 and explain to you why they, they didn't get it. Jared Goff is going to be a highly debated fantasy player this summer, in my opinion, right? He's been blessed by playing under Sean McVay in his system, as well as behind this offensive line who have been elite at pass blocking over the last two years under um, blocking for Jared Goff. If you put any other, you know, top 15 above average quarterback or running back behind this line in this Goff position or Gurley's position, you're going to get the same output. The exact same output as these motherfuckers have been putting out the last couple of years. Don't at me, Gurley. Running backs don't matter. Gurley doesn't matter. That being said, any other quarterback is not in Jared Goff's position. Jared Goff is in this situation. So as re recency bias usually does, people are going to remember how Goff finished the year. And it wasn't pretty, especially in the playoffs, even in the regular season down the stretch. But overall on the year, Jared Goff was quarterback six in fantasy football. So do not forget that. And he is much better with Cooper Cup on the field, which will be the case in 2019. If you look at the splits, he is averaging basically four and a half fantasy points per game more with Cooper Cup on the field on less pass attempts, but he's more efficient, less interceptions, more passing touchdowns, much higher yards per attempt, almost 75 passing yards more with Cooper Cup on the field. My biggest concern for Goff is the offensive line. Uh, Whitworth is considering retirement. If he does not come back, they're all pro left tackle. That is going to be a monster hit. They also have Roger Saffield, who was the ninth highest graded um guard in the NFL last year per pro football focus. He is a free agent come this summer. So let's see what happens on that line. If both of those guys are gone, it's going to be a huge hit. Jared Goff, this is a stat from uh, a podcast I listened to last week by Fantasy Pros. It was Mike Taglieri and Bobby, I don't know what Bobby's last name is, but Bobby Fantasy Pros. They did a top 10 crazy stats from the 2018 NFL season podcast which was fucking phenomenal. Like they, they make the name Big Facts Only proud from this podcast. Uh, I will link that podcast down below if you're craving some other fantasy analysis other than your mans. Highly, highly, highly go recommend that podcast. They also have the article on their website, which is 170 stats, not just 10, but they did their top 10 in this particular podcast. One of them was it took Jared Goff on average 2.0 seconds to throw the ball 60% of the time. So 2.0 seconds or longer, 60% of the time, which was the highest percentage in the NFL. This is very uncommon for a quarterback that is not mobile. Obviously, mobile quarterbacks are going to scramble and it's going to make their time go up a little bit. Now, I like Goff. He could put good touch on the ball and he could sling it. But that number tells me that the offensive line is blocking for him for a long time and playing a huge success role in who Jared Goff is as a quarterback, as it did for the whole offense. Like I said, if Whitworth and Saffold are gone, this offense might struggle a lot more than people realize. So this piece of analysis is still very much up in the air. The other thing that actually might be a good thing if you get to draft Jared Goff a little late are his home and away splits. 
they are also, just like Drew Brees, staggering. Far, 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 almost three touchdowns, almost 350 yards and three touchdowns a game at home versus 244 yards and 1.25 touchdowns a game on the road. Those are out of control. But again, if you draft him late, if you're streaming quarterbacks, at least you know exactly when to put Jared Goff in. Chicago Bears fans know not to play Jared Goff in cold weather. So he's a guy you're not you're not in love with, you know, being your quarterback one because there are going to be games where you know you don't want to start him. Uh, but if you get him as quarterback 12 or 14 off the board and pair him with another decent option, you know not to play Goff on games on the road or games in cold weather and those things. So that's a big takeaway here. And that's why I like super flex leagues because it makes you really understand and now like you really have to be good with quarterbacks. It's not just a lazy throwaway position that it shouldn't be. Um, and if you know, if you're listening to, you should agree with me because if you're listening to fantasy football podcast this early in the off, this is barely the NFL offseason, which is crazy. If you're listening to this, you obviously are really in tune and you are probably a lot smarter or you have a lot more knowledge than your league mates. So this would give you an advantage because you have to have a lot of knowledge to understand the quarterbacks. Anyways, I'm just advocating for super flex. Uh, let's talk about some of the other guys. I mentioned Baker. Baker will creep into the top 10 if they give him weapons. Guys, I understand how how much you want to love Baker, but his best weapon on, is Jarvis Lane. It's like Rashard Higgins, Antonio Callaway. If they draft, if oh my God, if they draft and kill Harry in the draft, Baker will be Baker will get that 10 spot. I'll give that to you. But they have nobody for him to work with other than Jarvis Landry. He cannot be the wide receiver one there in Cleveland. I love Baker. But listen, again, you're only going to be as good as your weapons for the most part. Baker's right there. Big Ben is right there. <clears throat> but actually, he's probably one of my highest. He's probably going to be my biggest bust selection at the quarterback this year. I think he's going to have a major fall off in 2019, especially if Antonio Brown leaves. He attempted the most passes in the NFL last year, but he was not good. He led the NFL in red zone interceptions. Ben totaled, and this is another stat from the Fantasy Pros podcast I just mentioned, which I'll link down below again. Ben totaled a league low 46% of his yards through the air. That means 40, that means 54% of his passing yardage total on the year came after the catch. 54% of his, his yards came from the wide receiver and tight end making plays. That makes sense. Think about Antonio Brown, Juju Smith Schuster, Vance McDonald with stiff arming motherfuckers for 80 yard runs and shit. So yeah, uh that's Big Ben is is going to regress in that category. He was not efficient. If you were a Steelers fan, if you were watching any Big Ben, he did not look good as a quarterback last year. If Antonio Brown is gone. It's I, I just think it could be a shit show there in Pittsburgh. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out. That is the the, lot, the list for the top 10. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did, make sure you hit that thumbs up, up button, please. It lets me know that you appreciate the work I put in for this. Rating and review and subscribe on the podcast would be phenomenal. Um, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you are new. Friday will be our top 10 tight end ranking. So stay tuned for that one. That'll be good. Um, yeah, that's really it, y'all. I don't know. I love y'all. Thank you for sticking around this long if you did. And I'll see y'all uh, Thursday, I think. I don't know. Bye.